Namaste and good afternoon. This is Dr. Srinidhi Chidambaram here, and I'm very happy to see you all again at the Freedom Series, uh, Freedom from Diseases Series presented by Apollo Hospitals. Living with uncertainty is distressing for anyone, but for those with major diseases, doubts and uncertainty lead to fear and stress about the future. And that is no way for anyone to live a free and happy life. To help you get rid of such doubts and fears, Apollo Hospitals presents the Freedom from Diseases series, in which we are discussing every week the latest technologies, innovations, and path-breaking treatments to help you live a life of good health. Uncertainty of diagnosis can be a major roadblock to peace of mind, but today, with the latest technology and extraordinary advancements, diagnostic precision and accuracy is a given for most diseases. And for those with heart diseases, the most incredibly precise methods of diagnosis are available, and this really helps in clearing uncertainty and chalking out a customized treatment, which in turn leads to successful outcomes and recovery. So let us today learn about how cardiac patients can gain freedom from the uncertainty of diagnosis. To discuss this, I welcome Dr. Abhijit Kulkarni, consultant cardiologist, Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Abhijit Vilas Kulkarni, MD, DM in cardiology, is a consultant at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Kulkarni specialized in the field of interventional cardiology, and he has a special interest in primary angioplasty, device closure, and PTMC, which is percutaneous transvenous mitral commissurotomy. He completed his MBBS from the Karnataka Institute of Medical Sciences, Hubli, and then his MD in internal medicine from PGI Chandigarh, and also completed his DM in cardiology from the Jayadeva Institute of Cardiology, Bangalore. Dr. Kulkarni has presented several papers at both national and international conferences. Welcome, Dr. Kulkarni. Thank you so much for joining our FB Live session today. Uh, please walk us through and tell us what are the important cardiac investigations that can help to diagnose heart disease. Thank you, Madam. Thanks for the nice introduction. At the outset, I would like to emphasize that cardiac sciences is one of the most uh, innovative sciences in the sense um, maximum research has happened in this particular field. And in the last 30, 40 years, we are able to actually pinpoint so many things which are very, very, in a very, very objective manner. So let us uh, go through an overview of this uh, by taking through a case, for example, I mean, uh, just to make uh, an attempt to understand what are the options available to the patients and the doctors through the journey of a patient in the hospital. So that's how I would like to uh, just uh, give a small account of the advances that have happened in this field. Say, for example, a patient uh, lands up in an emergency with some chest pain. So this is a routine scenario. Like most people, uh, they would come to the emergency uh, trying to understand whether uh, they have heart problems or if it's just acidity or some muscular pain or whatever. So, so in, in the, at the outset, uh, we have advanced cardiac markers which are available. Apart from the ECG, which everyone knows, the problem is sometimes the ECG is not able to guide through us. And sometimes the changes in the ECG appear only very late. So that is where the cardiac markers. So earlier, those cardiac markers used to be positive only after six to eight hours. Now we have cardiac markers which can be positive within one hour of the event. So that increases the sensitivity and specificity of pickup of a cardiac problem. So in case those cardiac markers are negative, in the sense they are not yielding, we still want to make a diagnosis. Of course, we all know about echocardiograms and the overall imaging modalities that are available to us are at a very high level of sensitivity and specificity. And in case the, 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 the echo is also negative, then we go to something called as a treadmill test. It's a stress test. Some people are not able to take the stress test. So these ECG, echo, and treadmill tests have been available for us in making a diagnosis for quite some time now. The next level, the next level is the CT scan. So, you know, CT angiogram. So basically, so when, when we are not able to make a diagnosis with these simple modalities, then we can take the patient through a one-minute angiogram or a CT coronary angiogram, which will give you 
exact quantification of whether there is a blockage and it also has the capacity to rule out cardiac disease in the sense that in one go we can make a we can make a decision that all this pain is not coming from the heart if there is a negative ct scan which can be done in the emergency there is no possibility that uh, the pain that patient is having is coming from the cardiac part so now this is just a simple scenario in the overall things so even at the this is a non invasive scenario for example what we have uh, more complicated scenarios the patient has already had a heart attack and he uh, has presented very very late in the diagnosis and uh, he has been given some medications and some part of the heart is damaged so when these things happen and we find multiple blockages so these things we also have to understand whether the heart which is damaged will it benefit from doing a bypass will it benefit from doing a an angioplasty because our idea is to give blood flow to areas where it is required and not to areas where it is where it cannot benefit in the sense only the heart the, the pumping in 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 areas where the blood supply is less if it is improved if it can harness that increase in function only then it is worthwhile doing an angioplasty or a bypass so we have lot of uh, investigations to give us an insight about this this is a very important concept Uh, it is called as viability which can be done through an mri so basically mri shows which portion of the heart is dead versus which portion of the heart is alive and it is worthwhile opening up of the arteries or giving a graft to only those vessels or uh, increasing the blood flow to only those vessels where the heart is alive and not where the heart is dead because that is something like a stone it will not improve with increase in blood supply so there are there are various other modalities apart from an mri uh, to show whether the tissue is alive there are investigations like thallium there is pet scan so these are important non invasive investigations which can give us this insight of whether improving the blood flow by doing an angioplasty or a bypass will actually translate into better cardiac outcomes over a period of time so that is an important insight we are not just opening up all the small blockages that are available we are just trying to find out whether our opening up of blockages actually helps the patient in the short term and the long term by doing these tests and then ascertaining ourselves these are all evidence based in the sense that they have been tested in thousands of people and the evidence is there they have been compared with uh, not doing this particular strategy for example improving the blood flow in a patient without doing a mri or a thallium and improving the blood flow after taking the insight of this mri and thallium so what has been found is if these two groups have been compared over a period of time this subset in which the ischemia the target ischemia is improved after analyzing the thallium and in only those territories they have done much well as compared to patients who who didn't have a viable tissue So this is at one level, and the invasive level also. Now, while doing an angiogram and angioplasties earlier, it used to be just opening up of the vessels by stenting. Now we have cameras instilled. There, 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 these modalities are called as IVAS. These modalities are called as OCTs. They are basically cameras. They are ultrasounds, wherein we can go inside a vessel and see exactly what is happening. Whether there is a cholesterol deposition, whether there is a blood clot. whether while the process of stenting you have damaged the vessel whether it can be corrected so these have immensely improved our accuracy of diagnosis and also it has improved our outcomes for example while putting a stent you know you dilate the stent vessel very very i mean the vessel very very significantly and it leads to some hematoma or collection so these things cannot be just judged by an angiogram which used to be done now these cameras which are placed inside give us this insight that the there is vessel damage and it can be tackled and for example sometimes it so happens that on angiography the blockage is not completely visible or the exact 3d quantification of that blockage is not possible by an angiogram this is where these modalities actually help us gain an insight and also especially in cases like pre patients have been stented and then they come back with blockages we need to understand why the stent has got blocked 
So this is where these modalities help us immensely to understand the mechanism of failure of the device. And that will help uh, progress in the next particular revascularization. We can correct that part and go. And also, whenever there is a blockage, we because patients, they generally are apprehensive about the fact that one doctor says 60%, one doctor says 70%, one doctor says 90%. So there is objectivity to all of these uh, kind of subjective opinions, wherein actually simple physics, there is a modality called as FFR, fractional flow reserve, wherein if, if there is a blockage, the logic is that when, when, when a wire, if, if this is the blockage, the pressure here, distal to the blockage should be significantly less as compared to the pressure here. So that can be invasively measured. So if it is 80% of whatever is there in the proximal part, then it is regarded as significant and this will help us uh, give a stent to the patient. And in, in contrast, if it is not there, then definitely can, we can do away without the process of stenting. So these are some new things uh, which have come up and they're extremely helping us in making a very, very objective decision and measured outcomes over a period of time. So this is a brief overview of, uh, you know, whatever, um, I mean, it can, it can just go on like this for a long time. So I would want to take some specific questions and try to answer to the point uh, which can make uh, uh, some difference to the overall understanding. Thank you, madam. Thank you, doctor. So basically, I just wanted to begin by asking you, uh, apart from an emergency situation, like supposing there is a person who, uh, who needs to know like you know the, what are the symptoms that you know a person uh, should be aware of uh, in the first place to go to the doctor and take these investigations i know that we also advocate that you know screening is important and preventive checks are important but what are the symptoms that you know one does have uh, or one can uh, think that there might be something wrong with the heart and then what should be those warning signs yeah. So I think each individual person's uh, perception of symptoms is different, but the classical symptoms uh, which you should be alerted uh, when uh, needing to go to a cardiologist are if you have a very strong family history, first of all. It's a very important cause to take a cardiology referral, irrespective of whether you're having symptoms or not. At least baseline risk assessment is very important in all these patients because genetics is very, very strong. It can really take your life away. And if you have a strong family history, there is a need for cardiology. Strong family history in the sense of heart attacks or sudden cardiac deaths and all these problems. Next, the typical symptoms would be, I mean, they, they generally mask up as many people feel that uh, they have just acidity or burning sensation in the chest. So this is very important and common symptom. Most of the patients who come to the ER also they will be having burning sensation. Most of the patients who have ignored their symptoms also will be having the same thing because it is easily dismissed. If they fail to believe and they fail to trust that it can be a symptom of heart disease. So burning sensation in the chest or acidity is a very, very important system. Next thing which can be an uh, important alarm is you are feeling fatigued. You are not able to execute works like you were doing earlier or as simple pains, typical pains like shoulder pains, burning in the chest and back pain, or when you walk, you get some chest pain or breathlessness on walking. You basically are not able to execute works like you where you feel extremely tired. And these are the symptoms which are very, very classical. But then even uh, atypical symptoms, like some people in an acute thing, they develop significant sweating. They get up in the night with breathlessness, so these are also important, uh, you know, alarms uh, which patient has to, I mean, which a person has to recognize and go to the doctor. And apart from uh, these, uh, you know, dizziness and sudden loss of consciousness, so they, I mean, they feel that, uh, you know, uh, I, something happened and then I just lost consciousness. That might be only, uh, you know, warning sign for you. I mean, we should take that sign very, very seriously. It is clinically or scientifically called a synco. So basically the patient loses his consciousness and then he gets up automatically and then everything is normal. So, but that whenever that episode happens, it's very important finding and at that time proper investigations and trying to understand the reason for the fall has to be explored and then arrive at a conclusion. It's a very, very important sign which people don't think, uh, people generally ignore. They feel that uh, something happened, it, 
they try to connect it with the food based things or anxiety based things or whatever it is so generally we go through all these situations day in and day out we suffer pain we sometimes delay our food and all we don't fall like that so when such a kind of severe episode has happened it's an occasion to go to your uh, physician or cardiologist and ascertain what is wrong with you um we were earlier talking about uh, people with strong family history needing to go for a baseline investigation even if they don't have symptoms so what at what age should they go to the cardiologist or to their physician and what investigations would you recommend for such people yeah that's a very important question i think uh, the most common genetically uh, determined cardiac histories are something related to arrhythmias and also blockage related things so generally many people will be having cholesterol variants so it's a lot of cholesterol that is produced and it is not handled properly because of the metabolic problem that's what uh, translates into multiple blockages at very young ages so generally if you have a very strong family history maybe uh, and for cholesterol recognition actually 20 20 years is recommended as the as the first uh, age at which you should screen for cholesterol and if you don't have any symptoms Uh, generally, and but you have a strong family history between 35 to 40 years. You are en- actively encouraged. Of course, if you, you can have sometimes you can have symptoms at a, as young an age as some 35 years. Any symptoms definitely should merit investigation. If there are no symptoms, at least by the age of 35, it is definitely advisable to do a uh, simple ECG and echocardiogram and a treadmill test. So these are basic simple tests which can be done on. outpatient department and if the results of these are not very normal then we can go to the next level of testing in the form of a cb coronary angiogram or something like that so once if if these are, if you have a strong family history and if these investigations are completely normal then you can wait uh, maybe once in two years you can think of getting it done again Uh, if they are grossly abnormal and uh, they they warrant some medications and all, then it is better to measure them more frequently, maybe yearly, and ensure that our risk is kept to the bare minimum. Nowadays, there is one more important uh, cardiac marker which has been uh, measured. It is a blood-based marker. It is called as high sensitivity CRP. So basically, sometimes uh, your TMT or uh, treadmill test might be normal. but um, it is known that even people who have a tnt which is normal can suffer heart attacks so this marker will help you understand what is your risk of having a heart attack so there is a simple blood based marker which can be done in people who are having more than higher risk so and this can be quantified and the best part is there are evidence proven therapies uh, if at all this value is increased to reduce the overall risk of cardiac therapies and it has been well validated in randomized control trials to modify the risk of the people by giving statins in people whose uh, high sensitivity crp is high so very simple marker which can be done on outpatient basis it will help us understand so the tmp will be positive only when the blockages are significant but the person can still have a heart attack even when the blockages are not significant what i mean to say is if you have a 30 40% blockage you will not have the tmp which is being positive so there is a chance that you might miss that diagnosis but you are if your hscrp then when your 30% blockage is there is high then your chance of a heart attack is more we can give preventive therapies to that but if your hscrp also is low then there is much less chance of uh, I mean, heart attack and there is nothing to worry so these are the insights that these particular newer investigations provide in the overall management of heart disease Uh, many people uh, get confused between like what is an echocardiogram and an electrocardiogram so as simple as that you know as these are very basic investigations would you be able to elaborate on what each one is and what do they actually measure okay so so just to clarify this question basically it's like a plumbing line and an electrical line of the heart so 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 uh, the heart has got a mechanical function in the form of pumping and to subserve that mechanical function it has to have its blood supply and also its electrical supply so every minute it beats between 60 to 90 beats and that stimulus like you put a switch on so that is the electrical part of the heart so which 
can be quantified by doing an EKG or if there's an electrocardiogram. So basically it measures, it measures the electrical activity of the heart, whether it is regular, whether it is 60 to 90 beats per minute, whether it is getting activated normally or abnormally. So these are the insights that an ECG gives. So what happens during a heart attack or when there is some muscle problem? So this electrical activity gets abnormal. So basically during a mechanical event, it doesn't get transmitted in a normal manner. So there are some variations. So we are trying to pick up a mechanical problem by electrical variations. That is why we do an ECG during the time of a chest pain because this particular reduction in blood supply actually shows up in the form of changing in the electrical activation of the heart. So if normally if the impulse is going like this and the blood supply to this portion is less, it actually goes like this. And then that changes the curves in the ECG. And that is why ECG, though it's an electrical phenomena, it will reflect what is happening to the blood supply of the heart as well. Apart from that, it is capable of showing whether there are increases in heart rates, whether there are decreases in heart rates, whether the overall electrical uh, impulse that is coming, it is correct, in, it is coming in the correct direction, or it is getting depolarized or activated in a different manner. All these insights the electrocardiogram can provide. So the echocardiogram basically measures the mechanical function, that it shows the pumping capacity of the heart, how well it is pumping, whether there is some area of the heart which is not pumping normally, whether there are some walls that are damaged, whether there are some leakages that are happening, whether there are holes in the heart. So it's like basically seeing it's the mechanical activity of the heart by an ultrasound. So that is what is echocardiogram. So they have got multiple functions. They are all, I mean, they correlate to one another. Each one will add on to the other investigation and will give us more information to make interpretations regarding the functioning of the heart. That is where uh, the electrocardiogram, which is an electrical activity of the heart versus an echocardiogram, which measures the mechanical activity of the heart are a little bit different. There are also tests like the TEE, which is the transesophageal echocardiogram. How is that done and why is it done? Yeah, so basically, I think uh, when we try to do the ultrasound of the heart, uh, we go from the anterior part of the chest. I mean, sometimes it is confounded by the amount of fat that we have on the chest, also by the breast that we may have. And sometimes uh, we, in the overall window, I mean, it might not give us an adequate image because of all these limiting factors. Because the ultrasound beam has to travel through all of this tissue before it can reach a heart. And then that is echo. Echo, in the, it, it comes as an echo and that image is translated into a proper uh, echocardiogram. So when, when these are the issues uh, that uh, plague us, uh, they are not very clearly visible. Then we go more closer to the heart by going through the oral cavity. TEE is basically transesophageal echo. We go through the oral cavity, we put a probe. The whole logic is very simple. The whole logic is... Uh, the whole logic is very simple in, in the sense that uh, we are growing, actually the esophagus is here and the heart is beating here. We are very, very close to the heart while going through. So we try to image uh, by going through the esophagus and there is an ultrasound probe which sees the heart more closely uh, as compared to whatever is there. And some structures in the posterior portion of the heart also are much better visualized uh, by the transesophageal echo. And it is a much more closer view of the heart as compared to your uh, trans uh, thoracic echo. But the problem with that investigation is it, it is invasive. Uh, that is why it is only as a second line investigation when our information from the trans thoracic echo is not very apt or not very complete. What about uh, the MRI? Is that ever used in the heart? Yeah, I think I, I just mentioned uh, during the overview of all these investigations. Nowadays, the role of MRI has uh, significantly increased. Uh, basically, it helps us understand whether there is a dead tissue in the heart, whether there are any scars that are formed in the heart, whether there is any infiltration that has happened. And MRI is extremely valuable in the assessment of walls, 
in the assessment of the right side of the heart, in the assessment of leakages. So all these are newer functions. These are not there 10, 10 15 years back. It, it, it's such a progress. So the, the evolving, uh, the, the enhancement of the technology also has enabled us to understand these things very well. And most of the times we are able to see the, the whole limitation of um, uh, you know imaging is that it is not live, but uh, the modalities like 3D uh, echocardiogram and MRI, they give a real-time image of how your heart is uh, beating in a much more sensitive and specific manner than what an echo can give and in, with mu much more subtlety and detailed imaging of all that is happening inside the heart. So it, it has got a, in nowadays, uh, the utilization of MRI for all these purposes is has become significantly high. And also in congenital heart diseases, it, it will help, it is very helpful to measure the cardiac volumes. It is very helpful to understand what structures are abnormal, whether there are any holes. It can pick up very sensitively small holes and they also can give us insights in a three-dimensional manner. So, so that is where these imaging modalities have an upper hand as compared to a simple approach. We already spoke about the CT angiogram and we have the 320, 640 slices uh, of CT angiograms, but people are often confused as to whether everybody has to do that at some point or there are only some people who need to undergo this investigation because when they undergo their annual checkup, many times people wonder whether they have to take this also or only certain category of people with certain symptoms, etc. need to take it. Can you clarify that for us, Dr. Yeah, so basically as uh, regards the slicing, basically when your slicing rate of your CT increases, its overall ability to image, heart is a continuously moving structure. So when we have to image the heart through a CT scan, if uh, the movement, I mean, if, the, if it is not able to slice the heart very, very fast, so that is what is 64 slice, the 128 slice, 256 slice. If its ability to slice is very fast, then motion artifacts can be reduced. So overall reporting of the uh, that CT scan in prediction of that blockages is much more sensitive. That is why a higher uh, slicing CT is slightly better. But if you are, if you are made to uh, uh, image the heart at around 60 beats per minute by giving some drugs or the basic heart rate is not very high, then even a 64 slice can give you the same quality of image as a 128 slice. That's one part of it. Second, uh, regarding the screening part of it, it, it depends. I mean, I would advise all these uh, uh, more uh, um, expensive investigations to be done only under the supervision of a cardiologist because sometimes uh, the person is not able to handle that information that comes through this. I mean, they get unnecessarily worried when even simple things are there. So, and uh, these make a lot of sense when, when systematically we go through the simple investigations and then come to these more advanced investigations. They help us in either confirming or refuting a diagnosis which has been, uh, which has been suspected based on a simple evaluation. That approach is always better. In some cases, when, for example, the patient is not able to do a treadmill, wherein a TMT is an important uh, tool in the assessment of these things, then your doctor can recommend them jump from the echocardiogram directly to a CT. But these, when we do it at the health checkup level, I mean, we can do it but to assess the overall calcium score of and what is the level of atherosclerosis that can happen. But uh, I mean, this information is uh, better. I mean, this cannot be done on a OPD basis, uh, like maybe your sugar testing or cholesterol testing or hemoglobin testing, because it requires a proper interpretation uh, by a technical person and the doctor uh, to make sense out of it. Otherwise, uh, people tend to get confused by simple things. And uh, the overall situation is that they get worried more despite doing the investigation uh, than, than comfort themselves for not having the disease. This is what I would advise, especially beyond a certain level, uh, to take the opinion of uh, the doctor and then decide which investigation route you need to go through. Doctor, now we'll take some questions from our viewers. So one is about uh, the stress test where, you know, like what is the difference between a normal stress, treadmill test as they call it, the TMT, and uh, is there also something called a pharmacological stress test? Yeah. So the basic idea of uh, doing a stress test is uh, 
See, most of these uh, simple investigations like ECG and ECHO, we do it at when we are at, in a resting stage. So when we are resting, the demand of the heart is not much. So when, when we actually try to stress the heart so that we, we understand how it is able to cope up with that stress, the ways to give the heart that stress are one or two important ways. One is the routine stress test, that is a treadmill test where the patient is made to walk. So basically what we are ensuring there is we increase the heart rate of the patient by making him walk and try to understand how his heart behaves during that stressful situation. Sometimes it so happens that the patient is not able to walk. For example, he has some knee problem, he's too obese, he's not able to, he's not used to being on a treadmill. So these things will limit our performance of doing a treadmill test. Then we go for pharmacological, where, where we achieve this increase in heart rate by giving medications. So that is what we do. There is something called as a dobutamine stress echo. Basically, we increase the heart rate and try to image the heart and see whether uh, we, we, there is any problem in the heart while in the heart rate increases. The idea of any stress test is basically to increase the heart rate. There are multiple ways of increasing the heart rate. It can be a simple exercise which can be made uh, on a treadmill, wherein it, it's a very good test, I would say, though it is very simple, it evaluates the uh, respiratory function and the cardiac function by this way. But in some cases, we want to be very specific about the cardiac part and the patient is not able to be on a treadmill. Then this pharmacological stress test in the form of double to double stress echo or uh, uh, you know, PET scan wherein we give adenosine and, and stuff to increase the heart rate and uh, these are done. Next question is, uh, what is the tilt test and is it used for identifying any heart problems? Sorry, ma'am, come again. The tilt test. The, the... So basically, uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, actually going into the domain of uh, electrophysiology now, which is, again, a very advanced uh, branch of uh, cardiology. So there are some heart rate related problems, uh, which can... Uh, I mean, as uh, to give a very simple example, many people uh, while standing in the prayer for a long time in heat, uh, they collapse. So this is called as a, this technically is called as a synco. Basically, uh, there are some reflex mechanisms that are, that get activated during this prolonged standing or seeing blood or in a state of shock or they experience immense pain. So that's some reflex activities that happen. And uh, then uh, the blood supply to the brain is reduced and the patient suddenly collapses. So sometimes patient comes to us with uh, this history of uh, having a fall and we want to understand what is the reason. So we try to replicate this particular phenomena that happens while prolonged standing by basically putting them on a bed which is supported and making it inclined. So that is what is the tilt about. There are scientific uh, measurements with that table to as to what degree we need to do. And there are provocations to be done in the form of some medications that we give. The basic idea is to replicate the situation which the patient uh, might have had. And uh, then we, we tilt the patients to around 60 to 70 degrees. And meanwhile, continuously measure the blood pressure and the heart rate of the patient. So in that case, if we, during those situations, if there is a significant drop in the blood pressure or the heart rate, or so that means that the same phenomena the patient is predisposed to, and it helps us understand that phenomena well and treat it in a manner that is suitable. It will be basically to rule out a major cause of uh, falls that is happening. And if that is negative, then that is again a clue to, for us to look for other causes which might be resulting in the fall. So that is how it's an important uh, modality in the overall investigation of falls, syncope. Absolutely. So the last question is again to do with the heart rhythm. So, you know, like uh, now we have heard about uh, ambulatory monitoring of heart rate variations. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, this uh, question has uh, assumed huge importance post-COVID because uh, COVID is known to increase and uh, decrease heart rates significantly in many of the people. And uh, side by side, I think most of us have uh, devices uh, uh, which can uh, measure heart rates and that has uh, led to increase worries also and also increase detection of these problems also. So earlier, before all of these uh, watches and everything, we had something called as Coulter 
Volter is basically ECG is a snapshot event of the heart. It just photographs your heart's electrical activity at that instant in time. But sometimes they require prolonged monitoring because the events that a patient suffers are very, very episodic. For example, the patient says that or whenever, I mean, I suffer a problem, I come to the hospital, but everything is normal because all my problems are only in the night. That's it. So all my problems uh, that I suffer are only in the night. So there has to be some, and many times it so happens that the patient uh, is not able to come to the hospital at the night when he's having problems. So that is where Holter comes in very handy. It is basically an ECG machine which is put on the surface. It is not invasive. It is just put on the surface and then it records the ECG for 24 hours. So these are ambulatory uh, monitoring measures. And now over a period of time, sometimes if the episodes are too intermittent, we have extended the period of uh, all these ambulatory monitoring. Uh, by extended uh, loop recorders, which are uh, which measure up to one month uh, and all these electrical activity. But uh, when it is external, it is cumbersome, it will limit your physical effort and all. You also have internal loop recorders where a small chip can be put on the, you know, inside of the chest and that chip can, you know, take all this information for close to two years. So that is where uh, these and they, all these, whatever is happening to the heart, can be just recorded by just a monitoring uh, this thing. Apart from that, whatever has been a very significant advance is eye watches and all these uh, smart watches, which actually uh, they measure, they are almost close to whatever information we get through all these things. But they just don't exactly, sometimes uh, they're sensitive, they are not tested for that. that. That is the reason why they can be fallacious. They can be very effective screening devices. And if they are abnormal, then definitely all these tests can be used. The other form of ambulatory devices is the blood pressure monitor, which is also a very important applicable uh, device. Sometimes patients get too worked up when they come to the hospital. Whenever they come to the hospital, the BP is extremely high. And uh, if we treat that level, the patient suffers hypotension because at the home, the BP is normal. So if we end up giving medications at that level, uh, then the patient suffers hypotension. So for avoiding all these uh, diagnostic dilemmas, uh, this is an ambulatory BP machine which can actually measure blood pressure every half an hour to one hour in a programmed manner and it can give you insights over 24 hours. So what is the average? What is the blood pressure when you're sleeping, when you're doing activity? So all these things have become very handy in the uh, sensitivity and uh, specifying diagnosis and making a proper assessment uh, in the overall better management of the patients. So, Doctor, you have given us a complete overview of the entire range from the basic investigations to the most advanced investigations. But I think the key message to learn is that better to take the advice of your doctor and then decide what tests you need to do. And if there is a positive family history or the slightest symptoms and alerts, it is very important to get investigated. And viewers, I do hope that you enjoyed the discussion and now you know what investigations need to be done. You also know about what are the warning symptoms of heart disease and also when you should seek medical advice as well as the basic screening. So till we meet again, uh, please stay safe and healthy and do subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the latest updates. And also, if you have any further queries, you know, you can always reach us on Facebook or you can drop us a message on Facebook Messenger. Our next session is on 27th August at 2 p.m. where we're going to discuss freedom from retinal disorders. And this is going to be discussed by Dr. Abhishek Hashing from Apollo Hospitals, Navi, Mumbai. So thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. And thank you, viewers. And till we meet again, stay safe, be well. Namaste.